Tu vois, de 110 mètres d'altitude, on a une belle vue sur Paris déjà. 300 feet above the city of Paris, with Jean-Michel, remember the adventures we lived since my son's first dive, when he was only six. Avec Calypso, avec Alcyon, avec. And in 45 years of undersea discoveries all around the world, we have produced more than 100 films. I explained to Jean-Michel why I took him here with me. Descending from the Eiffel Tower's first platform, one realizes how deep from the surface our Conchef 3 saturation dive experiment was, 330 feet deep. To be able to work at great depth for extended periods of time, saturation divers stay several days or several weeks in the bottom of the sea. Since Conchef 3, we have reached 1,550 feet in 1972, and recently industrial saturation divers have reached 2,300 feet, more than twice the height of the Eiffel Tower. Unworldly sights and sounds herald an adventure into inner space. A journey led by Captain Jacques-Yves Cousteau, pioneer of space alive. We're going down to unfathomed lands of the future to forbidden, hostile territory, where men risk their wildest dreams. Mother of life, heaving sculptor of mountains, a rough, rude, ageless, engulfing universe. Man comes to the sea in many ways, to play, to plunder, to worship, to learn. Some men approach the sea as sensitive lovers, ardently seeking total intimacy with the element that gave birth to life. All my life, I have been driven by an insatiable curiosity, and discoveries always fill me with aesthetic or spiritual joy. But I also think that it will be the privilege of humans of our time to penetrate this unknown realm and to take advantage of it while protecting it. In 1962 and 63, Cousteau pioneered saturation diving with Conchelf 1 and 2, the first human colonies on the ocean floor. These experiments claimed for humankind the continental shelf the shoulder of land that stretches from the shoreline out to where the water is 600 feet deep. Part of the month-long experiment, Conshelf 2, was a deep house, 100 feet below the surface. It was home and a diving base for two men during seven days. Now Cousteau is planning his next undersea colony, an outpost 330 feet below the sea, 
remote from our world, where the sun shines and the breezes blow. At Monaco Oceanographic Museum, Cousteau calls together his next team of undersea pioneers, the future oceanauts. Six of our most experienced divers will try to live at much greater depth than ever before. The leader is engineer André Laban, at 37, the old man. Christian Bonissi, 29, a tough, clever technician. Yves Omer, 24, enthusiastic, quick to learn. Raymond Coll, 27, cool, quiet, reliable. The cameraman is my son, Philippe, 25, diving since he was four years old. Physicist Jacques Rollet, 28, runs the scientific work. These men will live at the depth of 100 meters, 330 feet, and work deeper at 360 feet in a cold, silent world of perpetual darkness. The steel planet that will house the six oceanauts nears completion in the spring of 1965. The project, called Conshelf 3, is partly sponsored by the National Geographic Society. The steel sphere, 20 feet in diameter, is a two-story home. On the upper level, a large living room with a kitchen corner a dining lounge and a laboratory. And here, an air conditioner and a large freezer. Spiral stairs lead to the diving ready room, which is actually the entrance hall of the house. The front door opens through the floor straight into the sea. There's quite a plant around here. Pumps, purifier, diving compressors, and also hot showers and men's rooms. TV cameras keep a close watch on the oceanauts everywhere, except in their sleeping quarters where they may enjoy privacy. The sphere's christening by Simone Cousteau reflects the traditions of antiquity, when men begged their gods for protection from the sea. Heading for the unknown, even the oceanauts' strong, healthy bodies will be part of their search for knowledge. Elaborate examinations give their doctors complete records on each man. Only in this way can science learn what changes their new environment might inflict upon their vital organs. experienced divers, Cousteau leaves nothing to chance. Daily, he sends the oceanauts to sea to tune up for the ordeal that lies ahead. Even their training dives are filmed. They practice buddy breathing until the technique of sharing the breath of life with a comrade in distress becomes second nature. They build lung capacity and learn to swim at least 100 feet deep on a single gulp of air. steel pressure chambers will serve as life rafts and provide the only means of escape from Conshelf 3. Underwater safety expert Albert Falco tutors the oceanauts in every detail of such an evacuation operation. Should an emergency arise, the men could shoot quickly to the surface, sealed inside the chambers at the pressure of their undersea home. If the pressure was not maintained, bubbles would boil up in their bloodstream killing them instantly by air embolism. Now Cousteau orders the final outfitting of Conshelf 3. 
the undersea house will carry supplies for three weeks. Frozen meals, color-coded for quick identification, will provide 12 types of menu. Fourteen hundred sacks of ballast, each weighing 50 pounds, are emptied into the base of the sphere. The 35 tons of steel pellets will hold the house to the ocean floor. They'll be dumped when it's time to come up. <laughs> September the 17th, 1965. After two years of dreaming, planning and building, Conshelf 3 is ready. The top hatch has been sealed. The air inside replaced by a lighter mixture of helium and oxygen. The bottom hatch open to the sea. Before they enter, the oceanauts flush their lungs with oxygen. This helps eliminate all traces of heavy nitrogen, a potential troublemaker. The entrance door to their underwater home is 15 feet below the surface. The increased pressure inside the sphere prevents the water from rising through the hatch. Après vous, André. Ah non, après vous, s'il vous plaît. I cannot resist paying the oceanards a last visit. These young men are excited to live their adventure all by themselves. With pride and pain, I suddenly realize I no longer belong to the same generation. Au revoir et bonne chance. The door is closed. Conshelf 3 begins its vertical voyage while still moored to a dock in Monaco. Pressure inside the steel ball builds up to equal that of the water more than 300 feet below. Rising pressure shrinks insulation panels, and Labon televises a damage report to crewmen outside. The trouble will be easily fixed. By nightfall, the oceanauts have been sealed inside their new home for eight hours. As their atmosphere levels off at 11 times normal pressure, Conshelf 3 is ready to move out. Power lines and telephone and computer communications cables link the sphere with the towing ship. They sound a bit like Donald Duck, and it will take several days for the oceanauts to understand each other. The weird effect is caused by helium, which modifies vibrations of the vocal cords. At dawn, the convoy reaches its goal, Cap Ferrat, which juts out into the Mediterranean seven miles west of Monaco. During the tow, a reporter asks Simone Cousteau if she's worried about her son Philippe locked inside the steel ball. Simone answers, I have six sons in there, monsieur, and I'm thinking about all of them. Cousteau's team still faces a long day's work before the oceanauts can be sent safely to the bottom. This huge neoprene bag holds nine tons of fresh water for the undersea station. It humps around like a whale, 
seemingly enraged by the divers' efforts to subdue it with weighted line. When he's needed, Falco, the safety expert, does not wait to strap on the aqualung. With his help, the men finally win out, and the unwieldy giant is lashed to the deck of Conshelf III. Cousteau's team works with renewed energy. The French Navy Weather Service predicts that autumn gales will strike this coast tonight. There's no time to lose. A line of yellow boys stretches 500 yards from the shore at Cap Ferrat to the site chosen for the Conshelf experiment. Cousteau's men call it the Loch Ness Monster. It supports the oceanaut's umbilicus, a complex of power and communications cables that will provide their only life-giving link with the world above. Our first two conshelf experiments convinced me that it was wrong, because it was expensive and dangerous, to make the undersea people dependent on surface ships. Since we do not yet know how to sever the umbilical cord completely, we found it safer to connect it firmly to land. In gathering darkness, the cables are plugged into the undersea house and all connections double-checked. The legs of the house are adjusted to keep it level on the uneven landing site. All is ready. At midnight, Conchelf III begins its vertical voyage to a new frontier. Although they cannot see the difference between day and night, the oceanauts will follow a normal schedule. They will learn to ignore the television eye that watches them all the time. In the lighthouse at Cap Ferrat, dedicated men will be on duty around the clock observing their isolated comrades below. Simone and Jacques-Yves Cousteau take the first watch. Water temperature outside is 55 degrees Fahrenheit. This is no threat for normal diving, but the helium the men breathe steals body heat many times faster than normal atmosphere. An unprotected helium breather in 55 degrees water would in effect be standing naked at the North Pole. He would begin freezing to death. Yves Omer and all the oceanauts will wear a special vest filled with incompressible beads containing air at atmospheric pressure. The vests conserve essential heat in the heart, lungs and other vital organs. The new vest is worn sandwiched between two double-thick foam rubber wetsuits. Should the oceanaut lose control, the extra heavy belt weights would anchor him safely at the bottom. A naturally buoyant ride towards the surface would kill him by explosive decompression. The triple tank aqualung filled with helium and oxygen, heliox, is kept only for an emergency. At this depth, it could support life for only three to four minutes. Enough heliox to permit one hour's work outside would require an aqualung as big as an automobile. But normally, compressors feed heliox to the divers through hoses connected to the house. Exhalations are sucked back by another hose to be purified and breathed again. Itching with youthful impatience, the oceanauts at last come to grips with their adventure, the greatest challenge divers have ever faced. Philippe Cousteau will write in his diary. As soon as I have cleared the sphere, I am struck by the absence of the surface. A total absence, felt like a chill. 
darkness covers us like a shroud, my searchlight beam disappears in all directions, except on a flat and gray bottom. The hoses of our new breathing system coil like snakes. We will get used to them, but now they catch on every rock or entangle themselves one with another. Beyond all this, the absence of bubbles. In my 20 years of diving, the bubbles were lively companions. They meant life, joy, noisy poetry. Now poetry is everywhere, but silent, harsh, and for the moment, difficult. This first dive is the break from the past, sad and magnificent at the same time. One must learn anew how to dive. Fear pipes have become the essence of the bubble. The bottom is our surface, the night our day. I must find ways to fight the cold and forget my fright. Only a solitary boy marks the lonely outpost below. At the bottom, in conch shelf three, a new day begins. The oceanauts have grown accustomed to their weird environment. Though they cannot feel the pressure, countless trifling details make them keenly aware of its presence. Water for breakfast coffee does not boil, even when heated to more than 300 degrees. The heat-diffusing properties of helium make smoking impossible. Tobacco won't stay lit. The crewmen live under conditions never before experienced by any man. The oceanauts also serve as guinea pigs for science. Daily physical exams collect mountains of data on how the human organism functions under pressure of 160 pounds per square inch. Samples from various parts of the body are sent to the surface and analyzed for bacterial growth. My companions inhabit a submerged planet that is too deep to visit by Aqualung. To commute down there, we need protection against pressure. As often as I can, I go down with Falco in our two-man submarine, the diving saucer. André Laban, who will now lead the oceanauts below, was one of its chief designers. The saucer has already made over 400 dives in the past eight years, most of them to 1,000 feet. night, Laban has heard strange noises. Conch shelf three is perched on the edge of a precipice. Worried that it might slip, he looks for the source of the mysterious sounds. I get a strange feeling the oceanauts have become like specimens in an aquarium, sealed off from us by a thick window. We are close to them in space, but we are kept worlds apart by pressure. 
the only helping hand we could hold out to them would be the saucer's cold steel claw. The inspection convinces Labon that the sphere is not slipping. The annoying sounds will be recorded in the log as another unsolved mystery of the sea. Like all men in love with nature, Cousteau and his colleagues are concerned about contamination of the Earth's resources. Bottom samples are collected by the oceanauts and sent to the surface to be analyzed for radioactivity. Cousteau fears that atomic testing and uncontrolled dumping of nuclear wastes may someday poison the sea forever. Stored in a deep freeze at a temperature of 40 degrees centigrade below zero, the oceanauts' food takes 24 hours to thaw. Raymond Cole puts tomorrow's lunch into the refrigerator and selects the proper package for today's meal. Cooking is out of the question. In 11 times normal pressure, the ordinary odors of broiling or frying would be toxic. The pre-cooked meals, prepared by Air France, are simply heated by microwave. Somewhere in Paris, the chef who prepared the conche of cuisine will be pained to learn that his efforts were wasted. Although the ocean oughts eat heartily, they cannot enjoy their food because the mischievous helium has dulled their tastes and smells. They douse much of their food in ketchup. But Cole finds that caviar is caviar, helium or not. Paper plates and disposable water cans eliminate dishwashing. Everything left on the table will be sent back to land for analysis by dietitians keeping track of the oceanauts' intake of calories. For thousands of years, men have dumped their waste into the ocean. Now, as men living in the ocean send their garbage to the surface, the sea at last gets revenge. Cut off from direct contact with the men below, the Cousteau Navy keeps Conshelf 3 well supplied. Every day, pressure cookers called cocotte are used as containers and sent down with mail, newspapers, film, tape, machine parts, bread, fresh fruits, and vegetables. The upper terminus of this 300-foot dumb waiter is moored 30 feet below the surface to avoid interfering with passing ships. The personalized plastic bottles will be sent back in 24 hours with specimens for urine analysis. Later, the day's second shipment for Conchelf 3 is prepared. To send the dumbwaiter down from the surface, water is allowed into the cylinders. To send it back, oceanauts blow out the water with compressed air and the cylinder rises. A seven-ton anchor holds the guideline to the ocean floor. The heavy cocotte forces the diver to walk instead of swim, and clouds of mud kick up from the bottom. Even this is part of the Conchelf experiment to determine how well oceanauts can perform heavy manual labor.
To open the cocotte, inside pressure must first be raised to equal the 11 atmospheres of the house. To six men living together inside an 18-foot steel ball, every shipment is a gala event. Food, clean laundry, and an unexpected package. It's marked this side up. The gift was sent by a girlfriend who thought they should have some greenery to brighten their home. In the perpetual darkness outside the sphere, Philippe Cousteau focuses his underwater camera on a unique experiment. On a device that looks like a pinball machine, physicist Jacques Rollet triggers a stream of tiny plastic beads. Measuring their dispersal on a grid may give science new insight into the laws governing turbulence and the spread of polluting materials deep within the sea. Although the sea teems with animal and vegetable life, no plants can grow where the sun does not penetrate. What looks like vegetation lower down are really colonies of tiny animals. But the black depths are full of drifting plant spores. And Cousteau has asked if, with the help of artificial light, the basic life process, photosynthesis, can be introduced into deep layers where it has never occurred before. Dr. Raleigh has set a powerful lamp over a plastic submarine greenhouse. Samples from the lighted box, when analyzed in laboratories on shore, contained vastly more live organic matter than water from an unlighted area nearby. The implications of this work are clear. If optical fiber can transmit solar light 1,000 feet underwater, undersea farming could become a reality and at greater depths than man has ever thought possible. By increasing vegetable plankton, the basic ingredient of the marine food chain, we could increase the local primary production of the sea and consequently provide an additional supply of seafood for all mankind. On October the 1st, Captain Cousteau calls a press conference and invites reporters to listen to an historic conversation. A phone call to the US Navy's Sea Lab 2 in the Pacific. Astronaut Scott Carpenter, leader of the American team, returned from the bottom, joins the conversation from the surface. Congratulations on your very fine project. The oceanauts use a bag of neon to try to overcome the helium squeak, but with little success. An American diver 200 feet down in Sea Lab speaks in French. Labon and Philippe Cousteau speak in English. But both sides are afflicted by helium and neither discovers until the end which language the other is using. Thus passes the first conference of the United Oceans. The oceanauts' most critical job is controlling their own atmosphere. Their respiratory cocktail contains only 2% oxygen, but in tenfold pressure, that is equal to the amount in normal atmospheric air. Several times a day, Rolle measures the composition of the air they breathe. The slightest mistake could be fatal. To backstop Rolle's instruments, Automatic readings pour day and night out of the sea, up the cliff, and into the matching recorders in the lighthouse control center at Cap Ferrat. From here, the data are fed to Monaco's Oceanographic Museum, 
where a battery of computers records and analyzes hundreds of bits of information every second. The miles of tapes and towers of punch cards will keep Cousteau's team busy for months to come, analyzing what happens to men and machinery at the bottom of the sea. But no amount of computer data can reassure a bride whose husband is away from home for the first time. Madame Rollet prefers the video phone. Intelligence tests check whether pressure and the exotic breathing mixture have affected mental capacity. 330 feet down, the oceanauts score higher IQs than they did before their ordeal began. No one yet knows why. One psychologist, though, attributes the seeming improvement to motivation and total concentration. Tonight, André Labon takes the first watch. The diving hatch, open at all times, has become a discotheque for small fry of the sea. Plankton, silverfish, shrimps, and tiny squids celebrate the coming of light to their dark home. Lavon writes in his diary, these fish visiting us live only in the deep. I've never seen them before. They are delicious. Everything that comes from the sea is good, much better than all the tasteless frozen stuff we usually eat. Too bad it's so complicated to leave the house and get into the water. I would like to dive right now, only for pleasure. How exciting it would be to spend hours in the water, to see the bottom of the living ocean. This is the first time I've seen a St. Peter's fish so tame. Did it come because of me, or because of the light, or because of the helium? It pleases me. I like him. Bad weather, the worst the Riviera has seen in years, has until now prevented Cousteau from lowering equipment for the oceanauts' main job. In the perpetual calm of the ocean floor, the men take advantage of the delay and brush up on their assignments. Millions of barrels of oil come from the sea floor, from essentially the same kind of wellhead as on land. The trouble is that if you strike oil deeper than 250 feet, you often cap it off because free divers can't operate a well economically at such depths. They can spend only minutes and the work takes hours. Now the oceanauts will try to repair a production type wellhead 370 feet deep in the sea. A simple buoy replaces the big cranes and rigging needed to service land-based wells. It serves as a platform from which to lower heavy tools into the wellhead. Three of the divers have spent months learning how to maintain and repair what oil men call a Christmas tree. The bird-like mobility of the undersea oil men speeds the work. The oceanauts are working against the clock in this simulated repair job. Through closed-circuit television, their every move is being timed by engineers from the French Petroleum Research Institute. If Cousteau's men can do the job, 
they will be taking a giant leap forward in man's economic occupation of the ocean floor. The wellhead is currently under a pressure of over 2,000 pounds per square inch, exerted by compressed air instead of by oil, but just as real and dangerous. A small mistake could bring disaster to man and machine. The undersea oil crew must first seal off the well in order to begin replacing parts in the main valve. Je crois qu'ils ont réussi à mettre le plug en place. Ils se frottent les mains. Ils vont rentrer, je pense. The plug is set. The wellhead has been sealed. Rubbing their hands in celebration, the oceanauts now begin the final steps. They will complete the job in 45 minutes, as fast as most riggers can do it on land. They've been in the water nearly five hours this day. Their bodies ache with cold. Bubbles escape from numbed lips that can no longer grip the mouthpiece. These brave young men have made Conchal 3 a complete success, paid for in agony which they suffered without complaint. And when I see the lines of pain etched into their faces by cord, I am happy to tell them that it's time to return. At the Christmas tree, an oceanaut says goodbye to a little fellow who has been his companion for three weeks. An octopus is a bit like a cat. It likes to be petted. As they gather their equipment and tidy up the now familiar lab, the oceanauts have not seen the sun for 27 days. The last oceanaut to return closes the outside door. Only the camera in the diving saucer is witness to the most dangerous part of the adventure. The oceanauts are going to take Conchelf 3 to the surface without outside help. The sphere must have an absolute pressure seal. Although the hatch has stood open for weeks, if it leaks now, it could bring tragedy. A thorough two-hour check confirms every step in the complex procedure for return. Lavon confers with Cousteau on the next step. Conchelf 3 is two hours late. Anxious friends on shore can only speculate about the unseen drama below. Compressed air is then used to blow water from emergency ballast tanks. Once, twice, three times. A small tremor and a quivering needle on the pressure gauge tells the oceanauts that they're on their way home at last. But even now, on the surface, the men are denied their reward of sunlight and air. They must prolong their ordeal for three and a half more days for safe decompression.
The Conshelf log will note that in Monaco Harbour at 11.30 p.m. on October the 17th, 1965, the Oceanauts sustained their first casualty. From now on, it will be possible to perform any kind of work anywhere on the undersea extension of the continental shelf down to a depth of 600 feet. The total area of the world's continental shelf is equivalent to a territory three times larger than the United States. We owe this discovery to the pioneers of the Conshelf 1, 2, and 3 experiments, the men we dubbed Oceanauts. They brought saturation diving into the industrial era, increasing the yield and safety of offshore oil drilling. But the sea has many other treasures to offer. We are just beginning to learn her science, art, and philosophy, and how to live in her embrace. Thank you.